Welcome to the Steamy Romance panel. We are going to have a blast. Yes. I would just like to point out that my tiara has potatoes. I didn't know that anybody else wasn't going to bring their tiara, so just enjoy the potatoes. Right. We are going to, we just have a powerhouse of writers here. I don't know. Yes. Um, the books that you see, I just got first in series for each of these books. Um, we're going to give those away to people who ask questions. So the first five people that ask questions, tell us which book you want, and then we'll just put it down. Don't come and get it until the end. At the end, we can have the writer personalize it for you at the end. Um, they will ask some, answer some questions after we're done for a very short time, but Erica has a terrible cold, so please, no hugging, no handshaking. We just don't want everyone going home with Concrud. You can bow. You can bow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and curtsying is okay as well. All right, so we're going to kick it off. They are going to tell us who they are, what they write, how they got started, and when they got their big break. Go. I'm Britt Andrews. I started writing after being laid off during the pandemic in 2020. I released my first book October 1st, 2020. It's this one right here. My series is Emerald Lakes. That's what I'm most well known for. Um, my first year, I made $225,000. Wow. <laughs> um, I really worked hard on like cultivating my fandom. That's what I'm all about. I love the connection with my readers. And by doing that, um, the last few years, I've only published one book a year. And I successfully doubled that income to half a million last year just through reader loyalty. Um, so that's kind of what I'm all about. And I think my big break, I don't know, I, I owe it all to my readers, really. You know, they just, they show up for me every day. And the least I can do is show up for them. Awesome. Sadie. Hi. Sorry. I'm Sadie Kincaid. I write dark mafia romance and white shoes romance as well. I started writing initially in sorry, 2019, no, 2017, sorry, when um, my son died and I was just looking for a creative outlet. But I started writing as Sadie Kincaid in 2021, released my first book in April 21, and I think I made about 50,000 that year. Or maybe, I think I made the six figures that year, and then my big break was in the September of 21 through TikTok, so I had a few viral videos, and um, that was with my book, Fierce King, and then it just built on there, and then this year, I've, I had a goal to make seven figures, which I made um, a few months ago, so, yeah. I would just like to add that Sadie Kincaid hit number one in all of Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Um, not only did she stay there, bouncing around number one for a while, she's got three in the top 100 still. <laughs> Laurie. I'm Laurie Matthews, and I write romantic suspense. I started writing, I think, I went to a conference in Tuscany, of all spots, in 2015, and I wrote a couple books and thought, meh, I've kind of done it. I'm not going to do anything. And I went to P.F. Chang's, yes, and I got a fortune cookie. I swear to God, and it said, you were on the precipice of something big. And I thought, well, shit. <laughs> now I have to put it out. So I put my first book out in um, January of 2020, and then the pandemic hit, and I thought, oh, well, this isn't good. But actually, it was great, because everyone was home, and they all started reading. And my books just started to take off, and they started to do really well. And then in 2021, I found out I had breast cancer, and I went through this whole, I went through the, you know, lumpectomy and radiation. And then I got through it and thought, well, I'm going to make this go. I'm either going to stop or I'm going to make it go. And I decided to write five books in six months. And that just snowballed and snowballed. And I've been doubling my income every year. And it's just taken off. And I am so grateful to all my readers and for all the support because it's just been fabulous. I don't know who she is. It should be. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, my name's Erica. Uh, I have a pen name. I wrote that book. And, <laughs> and I made a shit ton of money. And um, <laughs> basically, 
I've got a terrible cold, and I'm quite high on lots of drugs. So, so <laughs> that's me in a nutshell. Um, I was inspired by Twilight. Uh, my book started as Twilight fan fiction. Um, it was incredibly popular. I thought someone's going to steal all the ideas. I'm going to pull it and I'll publish it to protect it. I wanted to sell 5,000 copies. <laughs> that was my goal. <laughs> and now here I am. So uh, thank you very much for being here. I just want to say, it's really hot in here. It yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine fucking Bateman gave this to me. Yes, she did. <laughs> All right, so we are going to do, so I come at this from a craft angle. So we're going to start on craft, but we're going to move into some, um, some stuff about marketing because these people have done some pretty incredible things that we want to get to. But we're going to start talking about steamy romance tropes. Who wants to talk about what are the must-have tropes for steamy romance? You know, you've got a murder mystery, you need a dead body. You've got a police procedural, you better have a policeman. What do you need? What is a must-have trope? Britt? Um, if you write reverse harem, you got a lot of, have a lot of orgies. <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's just what it is. <laughs> it's an expectation. Um, yeah, like... That's all. That's what reverse harem is. It's like you know, everybody loves everybody, and it's uh, found family kind of uh, right. feeling. Yeah. So, I mean, they're here for one thing, but they get like the feeling of uh, cozy, completed familyness. So your ratio. So for for reverse harem, you can do like a bunch of different mixtures. Mm -hmm. What do you write? What is the MMFM? What is the mix? Um, Everyone's banging everybody. Everyone's banging everybody. <laughs> it's a happy time. Okay, anybody else want to talk tropes? What a must-have tropes for steamy romance. For, I don't know if it's a must for steamy, but for me, I, I feel like the, male, the main male character can get away with anything as long as he's like, at the end, by the end of the book anyway, even if it's enemies to lovers, as long as he's really sweet and he's just on his knees for the female character. That's what I like to write anyway. So I was fascinated by this uh, dark romance. I'm thinking, well, it's got to be a lot of kink, right? And it turns out, no, he can be morally gray. He can kill as many fucking people as he wants. <laughs> but when he turns to her, she's the princess. She's the only thing in the world. And he can be like a cinnamon roll boyfriend for her, which was just this wonderful reveal. And I think your characters are quite like that, aren't they? Your bad boys. Yes, very. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to talk tropes? Sure. So for... Bit romantic closer. suspense. Mike, closer. Sorry. So for romantic suspense, I think one of the things you have to have is a time crunch. Mm. It can't take place over a long period of time. Usually, so it's it's sort of almost insta love in a sense because you really only have four or five days, right? It can't be a long time. And they, you know, so it starts with a big bang of some kind, your inciting incident, <laughs> and then there's a few, <laughs> then there's a few bangs along the way, and um, then they end up together. But you have to have it over a very short period of time in order to make it. Everybody's on the run and they're desperate and these things have to happen. Awesome. Erica? Uh, I think you just need lots of sex, really. Um, <laughs> that seems to be what people like. Um, so, so in, say, a 100,000-word book, how many sex scenes are you talking about? Uh, I'm, I've never actually counted them. I just sort of <laughs> happen. <laughs> they sort of happen. They just uh, sort of happen. I, as a pantster, I don't go, oh, I must have 33 sex scenes and maybe a half at the end. Um, <laughs> I just, it just happens for me. I really so want to know what half sex <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> it's where they close the door. You know. <laughs> All right, so now I want you to pick one of your favorite characters and tell us why they are particularly suited to be a steamy romance character. Yeah, go. Oh, I'm not ready. You're not ready? No. You Who's ready? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Christian Grey because... Yes. Yes. Woo! Yeah. Um, He's a he's a very uh, he's a very confused kid, really, bless him. But he's incredibly competent in the bedroom um, and uh, the bedroom area and sex. And it's uh, for me what I enjoyed about his character is that he is completely uh, okay with women bodily, all of that kind of stuff. But their feelings and the emotional side is something that he's not very good at. Um, and I enjoyed watching his journey with with Anna. Um, and what happened to him, but he was, he <laughs> went from being, um, you know, he became a daddy, you know, so uh, he, he traveled that journey very, very well. Uh, he started in an incredibly dark place and ended up in the light, and I think that's what we liked to read 
um, lots of women like to read anyway. Yeah, terrific art. Anybody else? I can talk about my last book, um, Lorenzo. So why he is such a, a great dark romance character, I think, is because he's this guy who, he is a, you know, he's in the Italian mafia. He is really cruel and his wife has died, so he's really cold and closed off. And um, he, I think it starts with him gouging somebody's eyes out. But then he meets Mia, the female character, and she just is like this ray of sunshine. And he completely, although he, tries to resist it, he falls in love with her, and for her, whilst he's still this really violent, ruthless man, he makes her feel, she's got this traumatic past, and he makes her feel really safe, um, eventually really loved, and that's why I think he's a, a great, morally grey, dark romance mm. character. So I'm going to take the opposite tact and tell you, um, one of my favourite characters is the female heroine in this book, um, Alex. She's a thief. And I love that. And that entire series, the women are on the wrong, the wrong side of the law. And I love that whole concept where instead of it being the man that's the bad guy, it's the woman. And then he has to change her. And he has to deal with her being on the wrong side. And I love in this book in particular, Mitch has to deal with the concept that she's not a good person in that sense. She's not like the one you expect to marry, like the, you know, the, the, elementary school teacher or the you know nurse or anything. She's a thief and she's out for herself and he has to get used to that concept. And I absolutely love having the heroines be different and be able to go toe to toe, always toe to toe. They're equal people, they're on equal footing and you have to accept me for what I am. So what does don't. he fall in love with? Pardon me? What does he fall in love he with? He falls in love with her spirit, with her whole concept of, you know, I can do this on my own. Mm. I love having female characters that say, I can do this on my own. You can either love me as I am or don't love me. That's Yay. up to you, and I love that. <laughs> okay, so also, I think my most favorite character is uh, Sage. She's the Emerald Lake's main character. She's a plus-size green witch um, who goes through this journey of, like, you know, she starts, and she's completely happy, like, with her life. It's nothing glamorous or fantastic but it's comfortable to her and she's she's comfortable in her body and in her skin um and she ends up with six guys at the end who are like you know you are a goddess um <laughs> we love everything about you and i just i really like her confidence um in just like her mind and in her body and I feel like it empowers a lot of women who read mm. my series, and we need more plus size representation. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this morning I was talking to the thriller writers, and um, Diane was saying that you know for thrillers you need <clears throat> you need uh, an antagonist, a protagonist, and a ticking clock. And romance is really really different because we don't always have an antagonist, but we need a reason for them to be together and be forced together, but also for them to maybe be apart. Do you have third act breakups? And um, what keeps them apart? Talk about what keeps them apart. So the fun thing about reverse harem is that you can have a guy of every flavor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you can have the nerdy guy, you can have the alpha daddy, you can have the, the asshole who's like, I'm not doing this, and you know damn well he's going to do this <laughs> by the end of the series. Um, so I don't do third act uh, breakups because there's so many different characters that I get to like develop and play around with that there's always so what's the tension? some resistance. So what's the tension that keeps people reading? Uh, the plot. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, I, I guess I don't understand the mechanism of that plot because everybody loves her right. and they all adore her. Mm -hmm. And so where's the friction? I mean, um, not that friction, the other friction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so with Reverse Harem, it's all almost, well, there, are, there is a lot of people who do the relationship friction. Yep. But my series, I don't really do that. It's more of the journey that they're going on together and, yep. and how they come together by fate, you know, yeah. um, and then they have to like overcome these challenges together. Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, so I, I've read that um, 
So, you know, plot is what happens and story is why it matters to the main protagonist. And romance tends to be on the story end. We want to know what's going on inside people's heads. And it's not so much what happens, it's how they sort it out. It's how they make themselves vulnerable. It's how they get together, how they fall in love. So it's the, the how, not the what, which it sounds it's exactly like that. Anybody else want to pick it up? I've forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, do you have a third act breakup? What keeps your H and H apart? I don't. I don't do a lot of third act breakups, and for me, the conflict is often external. So it will be maybe a rival mafia family or the their, the female character's own family. I did do a third and a second and a third act breakup in Lorenzo, and I think in my last the book I've just written as well, which is out in December, but I don't often do them, and I, I like to have the external conflict that the characters work through together. I like reading that as well, where the characters are, they'll have conflict maybe within the relationship, but often they're very united, and, and we'll kind of work through a lot of external things together. Fab. Laurie? I usually somewhat break them up. Um, with romantic suspense, you always have the outside forces that they have to fight against, so usually at some point, there's the emotional of, I don't want to drag her into this, or I don't want, he's going to slow me down, or we're not going to gel, or our lifestyles are different. We, they have all that sort of, usually, you know, in a fight, they discover that there's just too many differences and we can't possibly make it. And then, of course, somebody gets kidnapped or someone gets blown up, and then they realize they're madly in love. Like, so um, I like to have that little bit of an emotional thing because it ratchets up the tension when they're stuck together and now they're fighting being stuck together, but they have to be together to fight the outside forces. So Ooh. it makes it a little bit more. So there's a bit of trauma bonding. Exactly. Yeah, awesome, Erica. I think that, um, I mean, my, 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 I tend to go for a really powerful guy and a, and a woman who appears, who, who upon the surface appears less powerful. Um, but for me, certainly with 50, I knew that Anna was far more, uh, was far stronger than Christian, and Christian's actually incredibly fragile. And it's actually, trying to bring those two together um, when they have different expectations of each other that, that bring in the, the tension. Um, with the mister, you've got two people from completely different backgrounds to the point where this guy doesn't even know how to speak to this woman. Um, and, um, and it's external forces. There's a lot of uh, romantic suspense as well. Um, um, traffickers and ex, ex fiancés and stuff. So yes, it's all, it's all very dramatic. Um, and I think that drives the narrative as well. Great. We're going to um, just shift slightly into process questions. Um, I'm giving you a TARDIS. You get to go back in time and you get to talk to your fledgling writer self. What do you tell your fledgling writer? Because there are some out here. What do you say to your new writerly self? Hmm. Don't be scared to write a shitty draft. <laughs> Don't be scared to do what works for you. Yep, mm. awesome. Yeah. Oh, can you come back for me? <laughs> <laughs> I would say there are no rules. Forget the idea that there are these rules you have to follow. Because I know in the beginning, you know, trad is always like, these are the rules, and this is, you can't do this, you can't head hop, you can't have all these characters, you can't. Write what you want to write. Worry less about any of these rules. Because the moment you write what you want to write, the book flows better. And you can go back later and edit anything. But you can't edit a blank page, like they say. So write what you want to write and forget about all the rules that everybody tells you you have to follow. Uh, I, I, yeah. um, what would I say? Be strong. <laughs> <laughs> oh. God's sake, be strong. And uh, Hollywood doesn't know what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sadie, do you want to? Do you want to skip it? Yeah, um, I would say trust your gut. I know I made some changes in my first duet, Dark and Fallen Angel, that I look back on at the suggestion of um, an editor that I kind of trusted back at, at the time. And looking back now, I think actually I knew Dark Romance more than the editor did, and I should have trusted that, that what re I knew what readers wanted, and I changed that book quite a bit, and lots of people hate my female character, Sam, but she's lovely. Interesting. Um, talk to us about how you how you maintain your pace, what your writing day looks like, 
Like, talk to us about the writerly life. What does it look like? Well, first of all, I'm raging ADHD, so every day is different. <laughs> um, when I am on my game, I, I do a lot of sprinting with other authors. I feel like that, you know, keeps me accountable. I use For the Words, which is in, like, gaming, sprinting um, platform, which I don't actually play the game, but I'm like, okay, I'm dedicated to kill these monsters with my words, and so I'm going to sit here until that's done. So that's very helpful for me. Yeah, playing. Playing is a yeah. big thing, big yeah. thing. I writing is like um, everything else. I just kind of wing it and leave everything till the last minute. So that's what I do with my books as well. And I'll have six weeks to write it. And for the first two, I'll be like, oh, I'll just do this or this or we'll go for... And so then I have just discovered the joys of sprinting myself and I find that really helpful. But I will write a lot in a short space of time. Yeah, I can't recommend it enough. If you do not have sprint buddies, you get on Zoom or you do it over Messenger. Find those people, set up a time, sprint together. We do 25 minutes, five minutes off, 25 minutes. And you, you, know, you compare the number of words you've written and it just is really a wonderful, it's like parallel play for any of the autists in the audience. It's like parallel play and it's really a great re way to feel connected to the writing. It's awesome. So Sadie and I have the same process. It's called pantsing and procrastination. <laughs> so you kind of have an idea what you're going to do and then you write a thousand words this day and two thousand words that day and maybe you know 2,500 words the next day and then you don't write for a few days and then suddenly your book's due in five days and you sit down and pound out like 10,000 words a day. That's my writing process pretty much. <laughs> I'm um, <laughs> I, yeah, I recognize that as well. I, I'm decided to do my house up which is really annoying because that gets in the way of the writing and stuff, so um, I, I have too much going on and I wish I could clone myself and trap one of me in, the, in my office to just write. Um, maybe one day Elon will come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's face it, he's doing everything else. Um, but no, I'm, it's <laughs> my life is pretty chaotic and uh, I like to have quiet time to write. I used to um, always have to be out and what have you, and now I hate going out. Uh, I've been, Kate's dragged me to Las Vegas for God's sake. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I would rather, rather be uh, peacefully at home uh, writing. In fact, lockdown was fantastic for me. I don't know about any, anybody else in the room where you could actually escape into, a, into writing a book. It was lovely. So that's my, my time. So tomorrow I'm going to be talking about getting out of your own way. Um, I, a lot of people who know me know that I worked for a billionaire for a while. And one of the things I observed is... Um, you should do that which only you can do, which means every single day you get up and you pick you first. Yeah. Don't worry about the house. The toilet will clean itself, all of that stuff. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, all right, talk to a... Fucking shit. <laughs> um, not as bad as yesterday. <laughs> Oh dear. Um, talk to us about your release schedules. You said one a year. <laughs> talk to us about that. Um, it's basically whenever I feel like it. I heart you. I just like, wow. I've been <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you firsthand that I have uh, learned a lot about myself in the last three years uh, since writing and running my own business. And the best thing I could tell anybody is, if you don't want to do something, just don't fucking do it. <laughs> like, just don't do it. <laughs> Life is short. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have so many ideas in my head, so many series that are ongoing. I think I'm currently writing three different series all set in the same universe. So for me, I try and release every three months. Um, but that's just because I'm desperately trying to get all these words out before they dry up and I have no ideas left. Mm. Never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Sadie and I, together in this. Um, I usually try and write, I always think I'm gonna slow down. I promised my kids after writing five books in six months that I would slow down, and I haven't really. I still do about eight books a year. But my release schedule, I'd love to say it's organized. It's really not. It's like, oh, I'm done, and it's through editing. Great, let's release it. Oh, I'm done. It's ready. Great, let's release it. Well, don't we already have something else releasing that month? Ah, it's okay. Let's yeah. just do it anyway. Yeah. So, 
It's not really organized, but it happens. Sort These of are randomly. rebel fucking writers, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> Uh, I might release a book once every two years yeah. <laughs> because of the chaos, you know. So, um, so, but I'm hoping I'm, I might get one book out next year. We'll, we'll see. I'm writing something else. Awesome. How we'll do see. you? So, I am not very good at balance. I don't really believe in balance. I believe in doing everything all the way as much as you can. Um, but I hear a lot of people talking about work-life balance. I love what I do, so I do it all the time. Um, so, my question isn't about balance. It's about how do you fill the well. How do you feel the creative well? I come to 20 books every year. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, like I, I have an office space now outside of my house, which I think has helped a lot, like just to have the space that I'm able to go to that's mine, it's distraction free, um, it really helps with my focus, and I think that that just rejuvenates me. You know, I know my children aren't going to come busting in when I'm in the middle of a, a questionable act. <laughs> <laughs> she means sex. Yes, yes. And then it's ruined. So, yeah. Um, for me, I don't often get to, because I don't have, I know the question's not about balance, but I don't have any at all. Um, I just do everything, yet, And I would work 24 hours a day if I could. But when I do need that, I don't do it a lot, but it'll be like watching some movies or television or reading other books is really, really, like, I took a week off a couple of weeks ago and just read a, a load of books that I've been wanting to read for a while, and then I came out of that with so many ideas, not obviously to do with those books, but just because that is something that really fills my creative well, and just some quiet time as well, like going for a walk, or when you're just dropping off to sleep, that's when great ideas come, isn't it? Awesome. Like Brit, I find coming to 20 books, hanging out with other authors, it really fills my well to be with my people who can understand me, who when I say, you know, we can talk about sex scenes and nobody cares, like those types of things, that's like phenomenal for me. Um, other than that, I have my own office, which is really helpful. Like Brit, again, when you get to go in your own space and just write without too many interruptions, although my dog and cat tend to follow me everywhere. It's a little stressful sometimes. Um, but the other thing that we do, my husband and I travel quite a bit. <clears throat> and just taking time during that travel to relax, to just do something together, to see something together to do, that really helps too. It helps reset my brain. It helps dial everything back. And then I find when I start writing again, it's a little clearer. The voices are better. You know, the voices in my head, which I have a lot of. Um, come through much clearer when I've just had a little bit of a break. Yes, nothing like lying by a beach or a pool with a cocktail and just drifting. I think that fills you well like nothing else. Yeah. And I'd recommend the Caribbean for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to shift slightly and we're going to talk about marketing. So talk to me about the platforms where you've been successful and what you've done. Because I've been watching you. Um, we were... We were um, the, the, these three ladies closest to me, we were at the Mallorca Mastermind, um, and I just listened to them and soaked up what they were doing, and I've been following them since. So talk to me about the fabulous thing you just did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I did 10 fabulous things. Which one? Um, so at the end of August, I ran uh, my first Kickstarter campaign for a duet. The second book is not written yet. So, yeah, um, <laughs> it, it ran for 14 days and got almost 800 backers and $100,000. So, yeah, it... Tell, <laughs> tell us what you offered. What did you offer? What were the ranking up things that you offered? Um, so, everything's branded, you know, so the box that their order comes in is, you know, everything to this series, which is like uh, Demon Gang. <laughs> um, so it's a hardcover uh, special edition exclusive Kickstarter print run that they could only get by backing. Um, there was different add-ons that I offered, like character cards. I'm going to do minifigures of all the characters because you know people love 
Funko Pops and all of this. Um, and romance writers are collectors. Yes, they really, really are. And you know, the the special editions will have sprayed edges and foiling. And um, so I, I kept doing these stretch goals throughout the 14 days. And, and they were, people were wild they, for it. They were out of their mind. Yeah. Like, <laughs> to the point where, I mean, I would lay in bed and I'm like, oh my God, they already hit this $5,000 goal in like five hours. Now what am I going to offer them? Um, so, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun and it was really exciting. Um, yeah, now I just have to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. And fulfill all those orders, but... That's next year's problem. <laughs> Sadie. Um, I do most of my marketing on TikTok, but I also have um, somebody who runs my Amazon ads for me and Facebook ads and does a lot of TikTok promotion for me as well. Um, but yeah, my big break was through TikTok and that's where I find most of the value f in terms of time and money for me. So tell us what works on BookTok. Um, for me, Spice. The spiciest scenes always seem to work well. I've probably got a few that I've had a few viral videos on for the same scenes. A really good hook. So you've got like, what, 0 0.5 seconds or even less to grab someone's attention on TikTok as they're scrolling through. So it's, um, yeah, getting a really good hook. So give us a good hook. Oh, God. He's really hung. <laughs> um, one of the, my best performing ones was for my reverse harem, which is... Um, and it just starts like when she interrupts his meeting in a room full of ruthless killers um, and he's like snarls out now and he's not talking to her but it's just like people want to read well why is he telling her to get out so Good. that one works really well excellent so i do um facebook ads and amazon ads those types of things but one of the things that i've done that i found was really helpful and really successful was i believe in having a book in the drawer that's what i call it i always have a spare book because trust me, I've been through it, you never know what's gonna happen. And you, if you need to put a book out, you need to have something put out because you have like this long period where you can't write. So I have a book in the drawer, and what I've done is offer it to people for free, but because it's not published yet, you're required to give me feedback. Tell me what you like about it, tell me what you didn't like about it, tell me if there's errors in it, tell me where you'd like to see the series go, tell me all those things. And the feedback I get is incredible because people take the time to read it and they'll take the time to send me the email and talk to me about it. And it establishes this really great relationship with your readers. And then they can't wait to see the finished product and they can't wait, what's your next book and is there anything else you're working on that you can send that isn't out yet that we can talk about? So it's now a thing and we do it every year and I have all my readers read it like there's a group that reads it and they just love it and then they get and they'll buy it when it comes out because it's the finished product awesome um i'm very lucky to have a publisher who does all, all my mo marketing but what i would say is that talk to your readers always you know if you get something nice on your instagram or your tiktok or your facebook i have a facebook reader group which is i've kept deliberately very small um and, uh, and we, we talk about things in there as well. Um, but it's, it's good, they want to hear from you. And t uh, Twitter, I refuse to call it X. Um, yes, uh, on there as well. So people will contact me, they tell me something funny, and then I'll probably s reply to them. And I think it's all about bringing the readers into your, into your world of, um, kind of at arm's length, but you know. Um, but just, just replying and just, just being nice, be nice. I, um, I saw the great interview that you and Lucy Score did together. Did you see an uptick from that? Because I watched all the people fangirling from both fandoms for both of you. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't have that information, I'm sorry. No, well, it was, a, it was a joy. It was an absolute joy no, to watch a, No, Lucy was a, a great yeah. sport. She's, a, she's, she's awesome. a lovely lady. We are going to Q&A. So if you want, uh, so we've got microphones both sides, um, and if you want a book, you need to direct your question to that writer. Um, once the book is down, it's not available, and at the end, you can have it personalized by the writer. All right. So this is a question from our online viewers. Uh, for the panelists, if you are writing a series, would you recommend a stockpile and batch release? <laughs> I'd recommend one, but I've never done it. 
I, I would recommend a rapid release rather than a batch release. So you've got one and then a, a, I think part of the success of 50 was that the books came out very close together. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Agreed, that's how I always do my series. Um, a rapid release, if you can, is the best approach, especially when you're just starting. It helps build the momentum. No. <laughs> <laughs> Because I just can't. Like, it, it's, it looks good on paper, and I, I think it's a solid idea. I just know it's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> all right, we're going to go over to this mic. I was say. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, first of all, thank you all for speaking today. Um, all of you obviously have very strong fandoms, and you all have emphasized the importance of speaking with them. What are some creative ways that you've created that safe space for like your super fans, right? Like what, what have you done to keep them engaged over the years? Great. Um, I have a street team, which is basically, they're all super fans at this point. Uh, we have a group chat, it's called Brit's Weenies. And <laughs> I didn't name it, I don't know who named it, but I, <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it's nice to just randomly pop in there because they never know when I'm going to show up and neither do I. So it's, it's fun for everybody. <laughs> um, and it just, it really gives them that feeling of like exclusivity, um, that they're part of this secret, you know, group that they have access to you as a writer. And when you've written something that somebody really connects to on emotional level, that it's like, it's totally priceless for them, and it costs me literally nothing to do. But time. But time, <laughs> but they've given me their time, yes. so I feel like I can give them a little bit of mine. I'm keeping my eye on the clock, so I'm gonna go to the next mic rather than ask another writer to talk. Hi everybody, again, thank you for coming here and talking to us and all of that. Um, Closer I to the mic, closer. Whoop, whoop. Okay. <laughs> uh, my question would be, for those of us who are starting to think about getting into like Patreon or Ream or any of those kind of things, doing Kickstarters, where would you guys suggest that we start looking for basically manufacturers for these special editions? Um, obviously you can do like sticker mule for stickers and that kind of stuff, but like the actual books themselves, who, do you guys have advice, um, where to go and find that kind of thing? Um, I belong to a thing on Clubhouse called the Author Conference. And it is run by a group of women, all authors, who exchange ideas daily. Um, it's, it's, it's eight o'clock in the morning, Eastern time. Um, and you'll get all of those answers there. What's more, they have a Facebook group where they put all of this sort of stuff on. So I cannot recommend it highly enough. I've learned all about publishing through this group of incredibly generous women, and, it I and a few men, I have to say. Um, just a few, um, <laughs> mainly women. Uh, so I would recommend all the conference on Clubhouse. It's a speech app, and I, I, it's fantastic. So for my Kickstarter, I'm using a Chinese printer. There's a lot of uh, other steamy romance authors I know that have done this, and the, the, the products that they get are just beautiful. And it, the, you cannot get them at that price point in the US. So if you have like a large demand or you need a high volume of special edition books, I would recommend that. Thank you. This mic. Hi. So I am a reverse harem author and my first book releases in January. I'm rapidly releasing a trilogy next year, Lori, so thank you for saying that. Um, mine is more of a philosophical question. I write under a pen name. I love reverse harem. I love steamy romance. This is a very authentic part of who I am. When I'm published, I, if those in my personal world see this and find it, I'm going to get a lot of personal backlash. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me as a new author in this genre who really, where it really resonates to stick with my resolve and follow through despite that kind of anticipation? I think, Erica, you have to take that. Um, well, you try, and then some friggin' reporter will end up on your doorstep who looks like he's age 12 <laughs> and does his mum know that he's out 
And I open my door, and, and he says, are you E.L. James? And I, yes, go away, was actually more or less what I said. Um, but uh, you can't. You, you, if, you're going, if you're going to become successful, uh, hugely successful, they will find you, and you've just got to be prepared for that. And the thing is, is just to be brazen it out, absolutely brazen it out. So when the TSA says, have you got riding crops in your, in your uh, luggage? You go, yes, what of it? <laughs> and that shuts them up, okay? <laughs> so just, just be strong, that's all. Another online question. When you are uber successful, how do you maintain the rage to do more? <laughs> Anybody raging? No. no. Well, you write all the books in the boy's point of view because he's raging. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. So it's actually, it continues that last question uh, and it is specifically for Erica. Um, we've seen with the successful authors who were mega successful, that it's difficult to continue to another book. It's difficult to continue. Like we see Harper Lee, it was difficult to continue. And um, I, was, I was very impressed with the, the Mr. and recently with the Mrs. And um, I just am I'm wondering, was it difficult? And how did you find the courage to move forward to a new set of characters when everyone basically wanted you to continue the last series? I think there's, there's two things in that. People love my characters, not me. So that's item one, and item two, there is only one place from number one. There is only ever gonna be one place from number one. I continue to do what I love to do, and if people come with me, that's great. If they, if they don't, then that's also fine. And I think if you keep that in mind, you can <laughs> stay true to yourself and stay true to the stories you wanna tell. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys for doing this, this is great. Um, so my uh, backlist is almost entirely for young readers, and I'm un entering the romance, steamy romance, with a pseudonym, and I'm wondering how I can connect with my readers and be authentic as a male um, without exposing too much about my other uh, writing identity. Does that can anybody us? speak to that? Well, I have two pen names, and I keep them quite separate. Um, so I think it's just about, yeah, keeping your pen If You can choose to keep them as separate as you want to, really, and keep very distinct Facebook groups or wherever social media it is. You, for me, I have two different um, accounts on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, so I keep them very separate just because I choose to. So I suppose it's up to if you feel there's going to be no crossover for you. So it would be, that's what I do. I was uh, wondering too about the gender, you know, as being male, how do I, I mean, I'm not trying to hide it, but mm -hmm. how does that yeah. work? So I there are a couple of great online groups that you should uh, join. You should join, um, depending on how steamy you're gonna be, you should join the Smuthood, Bang, and Cliterature. Love it. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, go. Oh, okay, um, hi. Uh, I'm actually a sci-fi writer, but I've been trying to write outside my wheelhouse, and um, I tried to write straight romance, and it always turns into, like, smut and erotica, so I don't know, is there's, like, a line, like, a, a line in the sand, like, where do you draw the line to, like, stop <laughs> and get too steamy, or stay steamy and not go too far into... Anybody want to take that? So, if you, ha if you have a plot <laughs> that is romance... If it's all sex with absolutely <laughs> nothing else, that is erotica. Okay. In romance, you have to still develop your characters and like personality. Um, erotica is literally, it's just sex <laughs> all the time. Okay, <laughs> so, so we are actually out of time, but I would like to invite you to thank these thank ladies you. for their time. <laughs>